Welcome. Welcome to church today. It is so good to have you with us, especially if you're joining us for the first time. My name is Rose. And my name is Nicole. And it's so awesome to be joining together all across the world in venues, homes, and online. If it's your first time, welcome. We would love to hear from you. So send us an email, a message in the chat, or connect with one of your host team in the location that you're in. We would also really love to invite you to come and join us on social media. You can keep up to date with everything that's going on in the church. You can catch up on our content and you can get involved there. Come on. Guys, we are one church, many locations. And one thing that makes us Freedom Church wherever we are around the world is our DNA. Woo. These are 12 core values that make up the culture and heart of who we are as a church. Now, if you already know the DNA values, we would love to hear your favorite. So why don't you jump into the comment box below? We would love to be hearing from you, knowing what it is that is speaking to you. But today yeah. we're going to share one of my favorites, Come which on. is first and best. Yeah. And this is what that DNA says. We will serve God and our church with all that we have, giving sacrificially to the one who gave us everything. We won't just go through the motions or do the minimum. The best of our talents, time, and resources will be used for the kingdom. Come on, that's so good. Guys, God really is so good, and it's because He's worthy of our best that we're so passionate about this DNA. We're passionate about reflecting that in and through the way that we do church. First and best is simply shown through things like how we turn up, how we welcome people, how we treat people in our homes, our venues, and even on the online spaces. Now, there is an entire DNA series available on YouTube, and you can go and check it out if you want to hear any more about our culture, any more about any of the DNAs, and there's an amazing message on there all about first and best. Come on. Guys, if you're a part of Freedom and call this your home church, one of the ways we can give God our first and best is through tithing. So here's Shauna from our Chennai campus to share more. Being generous stewards of what God has given us is core to our faith. Tithing and offerings are biblical principles that we practice here at Freedom Church. If you are a first time guest or new to church, we'd love for you to feel at home and enjoy today's event. But if you call Freedom Church your family and consider Freedom Church your home, we'd love to take a minute to talk to you about tithing and offerings. In Proverbs 3, 9, it says, Honor the Lord with all your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Tithing is a biblical principle of returning our first fruits of what we earn back to God. In the Bible, tithe represents a tenth, and this is the portion we're told to return to God as an expression of our honor and trust. Returning this portion is one practical way of giving thanks to God for what we have, remembering that He is our provider and putting God first in our lives. When we give beyond our tithe, that's what's called offering. Although sacrificial, offerings encourage a generous and a grateful spirit in us. If you already give into Freedom Church, thank you for your investment and your generosity. You are making church possible in your location and around the world. But if you want to give into Freedom Church, you can follow this link. This link will also help you set up regular giving into our church. But if you have any questions, you can speak to our Next Step volunteers or a leader in your location. Guys, we are now going to hand over to the band and head into a time of worship. So I want to encourage you, wherever you are right now, why don't you stand to your feet, turn up the volume, and let's thank God for all that he's doing right now. Come on, let's go.
is one who's stronger. I pressed on each side. We will not lose sight of the one who's greater. Come on, sing it out. One day, one day, one day.
God has plans for us today. Amen. Guys, take your seats. We're expectant. We're on part five, the final part of Exodus, and we're so excited to finish this series out. I mean, we're on the back of the cave. I mean, this is like five weeks in, but we've only just finished in Cyprus, the cave, where we saw salvation and freedom. It's been going on for the last few weeks, guys. And just to hear the reports, do you know what? Through the cave, we had nearly 20 people get saved through the cave. Now, guys, I don't know... I don't know who gave the memo here, but the cave is sort of almost, you don't normally invite people that perhaps, you know, aren't saved. Um, but God is just doing this overflow of an amazing work because, do you know what? He's redeeming and he's set free. And even some people that have been in church for a while met the real Jesus. And I'm so excited to see people from different places, from different tongues. You know, when we had uh, those guys, in, you guys in India, in Tamil speaking, and uh, just seeing all that salvation and seeing commitments, transformation from one religion to a true living relationship in Jesus. Guys, we're on the back of the cave. When I came in after the cave weekend in the UK, I saw instantly the freedom in some people's faces. I want to tell you, sometimes we talk about the inside. It's not always what you see on the outside. It's very true. But when you see Jesus and you encounter him, there was something very powerful. Because I, I kept walking around going, oh, there's one. It looks like they've been on something. No, they've been, <laughs> they've been to the cave, but it's like, you know, oh, there's another one over there. And, and, and like people who were often looking down, whether that was with shame or a lack of confidence or this orphan thing we talked about, suddenly got some ownership of Jesus has actually called me. I am his. I'm chosen. I have a purpose. God is moving. And that's what I saw. I saw freedom from people who have been trapped in religion for 40 years, get broken free, broken out of prison, broken out of oppression. Guys, I've, I'm seeing it. I don't, I don't always need to see it to believe it, but when you see it, it gets me excited. When I actually look into someone's eyes rather than looking down, it gets me excited. When you start seeing, yeah, there's something going on here. Guys, we're in trouble. We're in trouble because when God does a work and he brings a freedom, there's always a follow-on story. Your freedom wasn't bought for nothing, but it was bought for something great. Some of you are still working that out. Maybe you came out of the cave feeling a little bit disappointed. Maybe there's something in you thinking, oh, yeah, you know, I just hope that I'd be further on. I want to encourage you that this whole series of Exodus is all about walking out of that freedom. And we've got another part to go. But also where we're going after this, God's just going to spend this whole year walking through, breaking chains, bringing freedom. So I'm going to take you through something today that I believe is uh, it's going to be a key to where we go. A key for not just this year, but the years to come. God wants to bring a revelation because when I mention this word, when I refer to this, some of us will switch off if you've been around church for a while. You will, you'll sort of, in a way, you'll disempower it because you haven't got a revelation of it. And if you think straight away, well, yeah, you know, I've learned everything you need to know about that. You need to come straight back be childlike, be ready to take on what God is saying. So, part five. Now, throughout this whole Exodus series, I have spared a thought for Moses. Because I've been thinking about Moses as a job description. Obviously, God, you know, God gives us all jobs. We've all got a job. If you didn't, didn't know that, you come to Jesus, you got a job description. Some of you are trying to find it. Moses, he had his job description. It included being put in like, you know, a little basket down the Nile. It included sort of white water rafting at a very young age. <laughs> It, it included like being taken into this sort of royal family and learning all the culture of anti-God stuff. You didn't, you didn't really have any choice. This was the job description. Then it included a bit of murder, which, you know, it, it sort of things didn't go too well there. And then 40 years, you're going to be in the desert, and you're going to like look after sheep. Great job. You've got to learn to look after the sheep before you can look after my people. And then this call comes, it's like, now it's time to go and talk to like this one of the rulers of the earth. And uh, yeah, there's, sorry, just to let you know, this is God saying to Moses, just to let you know, uh, yeah, no health benefits. In fact, it could be pretty dangerous. Um, there's no popularity there. In, in fact, there's going to be no promotion for you, Moses. I'm calling you, and when I call you, that's it. Some of us are looking for a promotion 
We just need to walk in our calling. Because you'll find that as he pursued God and led the people, there was never promotion. He just walked in his calling. Some of us are always looking for something bigger than what he already called us to, but we've got to walk it out. And here he is. He's walking out the calling, and it is not for popularity. If you're looking for maybe, hey, I've got some promotion because people like me. The Egyptians didn't like him. They hated him. His own people didn't like him. They complained about him. And he ends up going on this incredible journey. And I'm sure, and he does, he praises like, God, will you sort of just sort these people out? And then when God said, I'm going to sort them out, he's saying, please don't sort them out. I was thinking, Moses, what a job description. Guys, some of us, God's called us. And we're complaining because there's a bit of inconvenience. There's something about how God called Moses. What makes you think that your call is any less? We're in a place of sort of sometimes saying, oh, I'm not quite sure if I agree to this. Not sure if that fits with my plans right now. And on top of all of that, he had a stammer and couldn't really speak well. What are we complaining about that has stopped us in our tracks? Because it doesn't fit the job description we would like. So here we go. We know the whole thing. This has come up through the series of Exodus. It's come up several times, what I'm going to talk to you about, but I'm going to like bang this thing home, okay? We're going to bang it home. So you're going to think, yeah, that's been mentioned. In fact, first week, Chris Cook, all our, our communicators, all our preachers, aren't they fantastic? Everyone that communicated. And I'm telling you, week one, Chris Cook talked about it. And it's come through. Rose talked about it, referred to it. Jordan referred to it. And so I just want to take you back through. Just imagine, put yourself in, you know, if you're the, the wonderful Israelite people, right? You have witnessed God sort of bring 10 plagues to bring freedom. You've seen like these signs and wonders that are freaking you out, right? But it's like God is moving for us, people. This is the moment. Can you imagine like hanging out and having coffee and thinking like, did you hear what happened yesterday about the frogs? <laughs> Can you imagine? You just be there thinking, it's incredible what God's doing. He's doing it for us. And then obviously they have the whole final thing of deliverance. Yeah. Paraphrase, deliverance. Then they get into the desert and they've got the, the fire at night because it's freezing. They've got clouds in the day to protect them from the sun. They've got this inbuilt sat-nav system <laughs> guiding them, showing them God's hand is upon them. They, they, they end up sort of seeing the Red Sea parted. The enemy like just absolutely decimated. God delivers. They're thirsty and they need water and they have this water, but it's bitter. So then God says, oh, turn it sweet. We see all these things. And yet what I want to bring to you is just this amount of time. So imagine all of that. You've just witnessed all of that, people. How are you going to feel right now? Are you going to feel like God might be for you? Are you going to think we'll never forget? You're going to think we've seen signs and wonders that they'll talk about for millennium to come. We got to see it. We were the people that God delivered. We all are sat here right now thinking, hey, if that was me, God, if you just showed me a few signs. Guys, I've, I've heard you say that. God, if you just answered this prayer, if you just answered this miracle, if you just brought my partner to Jesus, I'd be forever grateful until I get saved. And it didn't quite work out how you thought. Because they started finding some confidence. There's something amazing about how. How in the moment we're there seeing these great things of God. And we think the signs of God are the solution to sustaining our faithfulness. And yet you look and you will see approximately about how long did it take before they started complaining. After all of this, how long did it take? 45 days. Not 45 years. 45 months. 45 weeks. 45 days. They're now here complaining. Not long after, they're celebrated. They had their celebration and their feast. They've even had a bit of a dance-off. Miriam has a dance-off. And they're all there. And yet soon, isn't it amazing how a day can switch from this to that? How we can get it one day and forget. 
how we can somehow, something slips into our life. And this is what I want to talk to you about. Exodus 16, 2 to 3, from the Amplified. It says, the whole congregation of the Israelites. So again, it wasn't just a certain group. It was the whole, which I find so sad. Where, where are the ones? They grew discontented and murmured. I want to just show you this word murmured. It's an ancient word. And this word murmur is mentioned seven times in six verses. And actually means an undermining of malicious moaning. An extravagance of complaining. (laughs) But it's quiet. Have you noticed those little things? Not, Not quite sure. Does Moses really know? How can we have to do this? Do you think the same? And we find like-minded people who just itch a scratchiness. And it's like, yeah, we've all got a little group of mumblers and complainers. And churches, his church, his bride, is being cleaned up right now. And do you know one of the things he's cleaning up is the murmurers and the complainers. Because right here, when we come back and we look at this, you see, they, they murmured. And what happens once you murmur? See, this undermining. What is the fruit of it? Rebellion. People say, oh, they rebelled. No, why they rebelled? Because they murmured and complained because of an attitude. They did it against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the Israelites said to them, oh, come on. Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and ate bread until we were full. But no, you brought us out into the wilderness to kill the entire assembly with hunger. First, they're not dead. When they're talking about the big pots, that's what they did with the slaves. They just had a big stew pot. And when the whistle blew, you went and got your little pot. And you got your fill from the pot. And they're looking back and reminiscing about slavery. Saying, wouldn't it be better if we died there rather than the desert? Now, guys... We don't realize this. You would think that at this point they are starving. They are sort of struggling. It's like things have gone bad. It's 45 days later. Do you know that they had all their flocks of goats and sheep? It says they they took them with them. Because they had a Passover just before and they had lamb. Roast lamb. And yet you read this and it's like, oh, you know, when we were in Egypt, we sat around the pot. Because slavery makes you think what happened before was better than what it actually was. There's something now that you're going to have to be careful with your flocks. What if we kill one we can't reproduce? They were in a mind of preservation rather than possession. Something was going on here. See, there's a flaw that runs through Exodus, throughout the whole of Exodus. And this is it. When you read through, you cannot, and this has always stood out and thumped me in the face. It's like, they complained. They murmured, they moaned, they complained. And they went on and on. In fact, there are 14 big complaints they bring. In Exodus, you can find 14 big complaints. There's many, many more times, but these are the big 14 complaints. They keep coming to God saying, we're unhappy, we're discontent. And there is this flaw in us as human beings. Even when God gives us everything in a garden, everything that we need, that that one thing that I perhaps can't have, that I want to grab hold of. And you see, this all comes through this one thing. Why do we complain? Why do they murmur? Is because this toxic attitude of entitlement. And so I want to talk to you about not only entitlement, but the power of gratitude. Because entitlement, you see, in this attitude, it leads to complaining. So when I feel entitled, I'm going to complain. And again, don't get me wrong, there are certain things in life around justice that we need to complain to see a change. I'm not talking, you know I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about God is moving, God is supplying, things are happening, there are incredible things in your life. But we move to a perspective of saying, Phew, how's it going? Hmm, not bad. Struggling a bit. A bit hard following Jesus. So many people. A burden to follow Jesus. 
Jesus' response is, why don't you leave? Because if you don't work it out now and find gratitude, because somehow you came to Jesus with a form of entitlement that says this equals X, Y, Z. This means you're going to sort out my problems I've had for 30 years. Six weeks' time, I'm still working through some of those problems. I'm a bit unhappy with Jesus. See how entitlement comes in very subtle. It's like this murmur. Entitlement will keep you in the desert. So I'm going to whiz through a few things I've learned in this, and we're going to go fast, right, because of time. So you ready? I'm just going to pull out very simply. I won't be going deep into this. You can go away and think about this. I believe the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us. These are some things I first of all have learned about entitlement. So first of all, number one, complaining is a thief of potential. When you get involved in the complaining gang in the desert, have you noticed how it's in the desert? Some of you are in a desert right now, and your complaining will keep you there. It will rob your potential of what is to come. It's a thief. The root of it is entitlement, as I said. In Numbers, Numbers 13, verse 32, it says, And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they'd explored. The spies had gone into the land. They'd seen the promise. They'd seen the melt and honey and the grapes that were massive like melons. They said... The land we explored, it devours those that are living in it. And all the people we saw, they were like giants. They were massive. Basically, hey, there might be this great promise and giant, you know, the uh, giant grapes, but we saw the giants. And they spread this bad report, right, which is through, what's this through? It's through entitlement. They expected to walk into the promised land and have it all cleared for them like a manicured garden, like a garden of Eden, they didn't realize they're going to have to go and possess it. So there's this entitlement and it comes. And what they did is these 10 spies came back. Obviously, Joshua and Caleb had a different perspective. So you can see even right there, you can see how Joshua and Caleb had something of, do you know what? This is an opportunity. See, gratitude takes you and helps you understand your resistance is an opportunity. It's like, yeah, yeah, there are, there's some resistance there, but sh- well, I think we can do it. Whereas the 10 of the bad report, a bad report always travels quicker than a good report. It spreads amongst the people, and all the people, they mumble and complain because all their hopes were on, this is going to be our home, it's going to be amazing. And they all had these images of their little nice sort of plot, and it was all going to be wonderful by the river, nice view. And it's like, yeah, but there's giants there, and there's fortified cities Can you just see? The place wasn't wrong, but their attitude had entitlement within it, and it was saying, oh, we expected something very different. And I want to say to us all that I've I've learned this through the years, that this attitude of entitlement, which fruit is complaining and murmuring, eventually brings division. It's like secondhand smoke. If you've been in a car with someone that smokes, is a smoker, smokes cigarettes, you can't escape the smoke, you wind down the window, but you're in that place, and it's like, get me, first you're probably not going to get in the car, but if you're in the car, you're going to get affected, although you're not the one who is smoking. Some of you are hanging around complainers, who are habitually complainers, who have this spirit of entitlement, And you're constantly trying to bring a positive outlook. You're constantly trying to say, hey, do you know what? Let's just like, let's just be thankful for maybe what you do have. Let's like just be, have some gratitude here. And there is this secondhand smoke is getting in your lungs and it's killing you. Because eventually there'll be one thing that you actually think, I think you're right there. In fact, yes. I, do you know what? I identify with that. That hurt because do you know something else about the murmur? Murmur, when you look at the meaning, also has the word grudge in. (laughs) Begrudge. Offense is the ugly sister of entitlement. (sighs) We gotta watch out whose company we keep. 
because we can end up in a place where we're affected by others. Secondhand smoke. Number two, entitlement is rooted in slavery. You think about entitlement. Everything about it will keep you in slavery. It won't free your life. And one of the things that it actually does is entitlement really takes responsibility from me. And when I'm responsible, I'm then accountable. If I'm accountable, I can make choices to live the life God's called me to live. But when it's other people, see, entitlement will always say expectation. I feel I deserve this. God, I, I came and followed you, but this didn't work out. This has been hard. Maybe I went on that church plant. Maybe, I don't know, I stepped up as a leader and things didn't work out. And I feel, That entitlement will come, you see, and keep you in slavery. There's something that is saying, okay, there's something I can learn, something I can move through. And the moment that we move into a place of responsibility and accountability, we move in because you grab hold of this thing that says, you know what, I'm growing, I'm on a journey, I'm moving, but I will not get trapped in slavery thinking. We talk about coming out of Egypt, and so many times I'll say this, but when they got out of Egypt, they had to get Egypt out of them. And that's slavery thinking. And we came to Jesus. We came and we, we're, we're perhaps following him right now, but there is slavery thinking within us, and part of that is entitlement. It will keep you trapped for years. They end up having this sort of view of the slave food, slavery food from the pot was better than the miracle food. We talk about manna and the provision of manna that reigned for all these years. It wasn't just like a lump of dough. It describes it as coriander and olive and olive oil and add all this sort of different sort of flavor to it. But they'd missed the miracle. But entitlement says, no, we deserve more. How have we got stuck in that entitlement? Number, numbers 11, verse 4 to 6. The rabble with them, the rabble. <laughs> Complainers are always known as a rabble in the Bible. With them began to crave other food. They had food. They weren't hungry, but they craved other food. And again, the Israelites started wailing. Can you imagine? They were wailing. You normally wail when someone's died. They're wailing because they want different menu. See, God is showing us sometimes we're wailing because we're not getting the preference on the menu served up by God in his kingdom. We're saying, hey, I'm not happy about this. And this is what gets me when I hear people say, well, you know, I'd much prefer this. I much prefer a little bit more uh, expository teaching. I'd, I'd much prefer sort of more sort of like, you know, pastoral group sort of focus. And it is amazing how we can get in a place where preference becomes... Bondage to us. They say, if only we had meat to eat. Remember the fish that we ate in Egypt. Didn't cost us. And then they go through. And then, let's just mention it. Cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions. We had a bit of garlic thrown in. I mean, heck, <laughs> these guys. But now, we've lost our appetite. We never see anything but this miracle, God-given Heaven, bread from heaven, bread from heaven all the time. I mean, for goodness sake, what is this? Miracles every day. We need a break. How much are we walking in the miracle of our salvation every day and not giving thanks for it? It's not a burden, it's an opportunity. It's something that he's done for our life. See, this in Egypt, they brought a spirit of discontent. Discontentment. And I want, as I speak now, I, be, I believe that we deal with principalities, powers, and high places. We deal with familiar spirits that will grab hold of our lives. And I'm speaking to some people now where you have come from a generation of complainers. We're all susceptible to it, but some are so entrenched in it, we're stuck in it, and even now you don't see it. You actually feel entitled to have your own opinion. Uh, you don't know what it's been like for me. And you don't know what I've been through. And this is what entitlement does. It's fueled by pride. <laughs> and it keeps us stuck. And I believe that right now the Holy Spirit wants to break through this word. He wants to expose. Holy Spirit, I'm asking. Will you reveal 
the spirit of discontentment in our lives. If somehow we are in a cyclical pattern where we just, I don't know, there's just something, we mumble and we grumble very easily. Discontentment is in our heart. I'm asking you, Jesus, will you set us free? Holy Spirit, will you reveal so that we can repent today? Oh, we need to get free of this. Otherwise, we're going to get stuck in the desert. Lord, I pray we're going to get stuck in the desert. Maybe our kids are going to get stuck in the desert. You want to set us free. Will you set us free right now? I ask in Jesus' name for everyone here in this word, reveal, Holy Spirit, where the enemy has set a snare, and Jesus, come with your blood and your power to break the bondage of the enemy. In Jesus' name. Number three, ready? <laughs> Number three, entitlement makes you ask desert questions. So when you have entitlement, you get stuck in the desert, and when you're in the desert, you ask desert questions, desert-style questions. You, you shouldn't just ask any questions. You need to ask the right questions to God. Some of us are fueled out of the desert rather than out of our faith. Some of us are almost asking things to God that we should just be quiet on and trust. Some of us are confessing things. 14 times they complained. The big complaints of the nation. In the end, God said, because they kept saying, oh, we're going to die. We're going we're gonna to die on the sword and we may as well have been back in Egypt because we're going to die in the wilderness. We're gonna, and they keep saying that. In the end, God says, I've... He's so patient, God. You see, he, he goes out of his way to help them. In the end, he says, let's give them what they want. <laughs> and die in the wilderness. Because <laughs> of this constant confession. Asking desert questions. A focus on fear. An unbelief. Because even entitlement has a form of unbelief. In fact, our complaining is evidence of unbelief. Numbers 14, verse 3. So the, the spies come back with a report, and uh, they obviously have all this like upset because it wasn't as they expected. And then this is the question they ask. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? <laughs> so they've just seen the promised land. They've seen humongous grapes. They've seen the potential of the promise. Guys, you can walk into the promise. Some of you have seen the promise, but you didn't focus on the promise. You asked the wrong question. You saw the resistance. You didn't know how to get there. So instead, it's like, well, you know, it might be great over there. It might be great what God is saying to us, but how are we going to get? Why? See? Why? It's a desert question. Is the Lord bringing us into this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us? To go back to Egypt. Even at this point, they've seen the promised land. Now they're saying, do you know what? May as well fall on our swords. Nothing's happened. Because part of entitlement breeds anxiety. And anxiety, this worry, this thing of like, you know, they're worrying about stuff that hasn't even happened. But what they're doing is all the time, they're saying, we don't believe God brought us this far to take us through. But to fall on a sword... We may as well go back. Where are we questioning God, saying, can't work out the way through here, God? How come you brought me this far? May as well go back to Egypt. Following you has been difficult, you know, and the dazzling lights of the past are attracting me back of slavery central. <laughs> Better I go back to what I know than fall on my sword in the desert. There's another option. It's called possess the promise. It's called an attitude to say we can do it. There may be resistance, but we can actually do this. See, every entitlement, when it gets in your life, in marriage, if I have entitlement within my marriage, I feel I don't have to change. If I feel entitled to the wealth put in my hands... I'll be a grumpy giver. If I feel entitled to that grudge or that hurt because of what someone did, I will live in unforgiveness. Because I felt entitled to an apology. 
Entitlement will keep you in slavery. Number four, ready? We're now moving on to gratitude. I know we got this last bit. Let's fire, fire. Gratitude is a chosen attitude. You've got to realize it's a chosen attitude. It doesn't come out of the sky. It doesn't just land on you one day. I've learned you have to go after gratitude. You exercise it. It's constant. Sometimes you let the ball down. You've got to pick it up. Things happen in your life where you're discouraged and you start to moan and complain. Guys, I'm, I'm a human being, and there are times where things happen, unexpected things, and it's like discouraging, and I just hear myself beginning to moan and complain to Heather. Yeah. And then half an hour later, Heather says, perhaps we'll pray about it. And then I'm inside, I'm going... I can't do it outside. I constantly, there's this like muscle that I'm like, I need to choose gratitude. I know it's a chosen attitude. It's going to be the thing that sees me through. I've got to see this through. It's not circumstantial. If it was circumstantial, they saw 45 days of the world's greatest miracles. So you think it's circumstantial. You think if that answered prayer, if that provision comes through, you've got to, you've got to almost like just get your head down and say, regardless of what, I'm not staying in the desert, I'm coming through. What will get you through the desert, get you in the promise? It will be gratitude every time. Gratitude is underestimated. You hear the word gratitude, but you don't understand the power of it. The power of gratitude, it will fire you. This is like rocket fuel for you as a believer. It will see you through. See, entitlement begins where my gratitude ends. So we obviously wrote the book and released the book in February of Firestars, and it's like basically 30 years of our journey. People will ask, and they'll say, you know, how do you keep going? Because in there we put all the struggles, the challenges, the discouragement, um, just all the things that were painful that we went through, as well as the great miracles, the faithfulness, fruitfulness of God. It was all in there, the whole journey. That's our, like, sort of exodus. And in there... At the beginning, you might not realize this, but at the beginning, when we started pastoring, I was full of entitlement. I was a 22-year-old who, in a way, I put it down to, I just got faith. I'm going to change. I mean, good motivation. We want to change our town. We want to see everyone reached, and we went about reaching everyone we could. But guess what? Not everyone was interested. We thought by the end of the year, we we're going to have a full like, you know, room. We wouldn't be able to fit them all in. Six people. Do you know what I mean? We, we then started moving forward and we saw, we, we saw some people come in and then we saw more people go. <laughs> we had our tambourine for worship. We thought, where's the, come on, we're going to attract a great band. No, you've got a tambourine and a triangle. <laughs> Wave the flag for some color. <laughs> Guys, I'm telling you, it was painful. I had this entitlement. We, we reached and we saw young people coming in from non-church backgrounds and we saw them choose to follow Jesus and we thought wow come on it's revival only for them to sort of walk away and all this entitlement God brought probably after seven or eight years and says oh yeah you started this on entitlement didn't you you thought and you already decided how I was going to build my church you're going to need to choose gratitude to see you through see this is how you keep going what we learned in the years to come, people say, how do you keep going? We suddenly put to death entitlement and we resurrected gratitude. That when we saw one person saved in seven years, we celebrated. That's why, guys, for some of you, you know, when we say, hey, 11 people saved in Tamil, India. You know, and, and, the, and we're like, yeah! I tell you what, there, there's no bigger cry than in our hearts. Because over 30 years ago, we celebrated for seven years one salvation. I'm hearing about people that I haven't even met from another language, like in another nation, who are coming to know Jesus, and 11 people are getting saved. But for some of us, we can't even get excited about it. Because we don't really know what the cost is, because there's an entitlement. Oh, well, that's what we do as a church, isn't it? You know, we, we mention almost most weeks we see salvation. What happens? Entitlement creeps in. Entitlement creeps in. Entitlement keeps you on the, sitting on the chair, 
rather than celebrate it. Come on. Didn't realize at, at that stage, it's almost like not that dangerous, but it's where it goes. Yeah. <laughs> Thankfulness. I remember when we had such a small band of volunteers and Heather and I did the youth and we did the kids' work and the holiday clubs and I dressed up as a pirate. <laughs> and we sorted out the chairs and we did all that stuff. That is why, i got to say, every volunteer of Freedom Church, we, we know where you are. We know what it's like to be out week after week, serving, serving. But then what comes after? What you're doing, what you're a part of, it is... See, it's something about remembering, whereas immediately, oh, I, feel, I feel, you know, entitled just to come and observe, make my comments. Even where you're sitting right now is a sign of you coming as an observer. And that's what happened. That's what happened here. They came in. Things didn't meet their standard, expectation. So they mumbled. They grumbled. They got into slavery thinking. See, gratitude causes movement. It will move you through the desert. It comes. It's powerful. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18. It says, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will. Not an idea, people. It's not a suggestion. It actually says God's will. You want to know what God's will for you is? If you don't know anything, I just don't know what God's will is for my life right now. It says, give thanks. In every circumstance, it's not circumstantial. This is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. This is essential. And do you know what the verse says right after verse 19? Which is always connected to the previous verse. So give thanks in all things, all circumstances. And it says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I read that and I thought, Whoa. <laughs> Tell me it's right there. Don't quench the Holy Spirit. And we all, we all shudder at that. Oh, don't quench the Holy Spirit. Oh, maybe quenching the Holy Spirit is linked with the fact that you are not bringing thanksgiving, which is a denial of God's faithfulness. And that stirs me because it's around entitlement. So the Holy Spirit hates entitlement. I want to go as far to say, if entitlement is resident in you, there's less of the Holy Spirit in you. When we partake habitually of complaining, we all, we all complain, have a moan, and we put ourselves right, but when complaining is part of our, you know you've been around those people who are just, it's always moaning, they're moany people. There's always something wrong. Moany, moany, complaining. Entitled. There is a lack of the Holy Spirit in that believer. The more gratitude a person displays, I believe is a sign of more of the presence of the Holy Spirit in their life. So we're newly there. Hold on. Hold on. I know I'm throwing a lot this last one. We should have done six, but we are on five. Okay. Right. So number five is gratitude does not prescribe provision. What that means prescribe coming from the word describe. Sometimes we're describing what provision looks like when you're not the provider you're the receiver. Gratitude understands, I may be praying for this, but God's provision might look very different. Anyone who's followed Jesus for a while, you start to understand this. God, I just need this. I need this man. Not if you're single. Do you know what I mean? It's like, and you're in a Christian light, and you're looking for a relationship. And you're thinking, this is the one, this is the relationship, Lord, speak to him. <laughs> speak to him. <laughs> Give me a sign. <laughs> and it doesn't come off. And it's like another rejection. Yeah, a year later, you're so thankful. Because you meet the one that he planned. And in fact, you wouldn't want to be with that guy. <laughs> I'm just saying there are jobs that we just called out for and God said no. Sometimes when we pray about a certain thing, God said, send someone difficult in your life 
to build something powerful in your life to get you actually through the desert to get to the promise. That was God's provision right now, but your provision was to have someone who's going to come and stroke you and say it's all okay and come and pray another prayer for the 10th time about the same thing, the same attitude you have when God is saying, no, I'm going to send someone who's going to challenge you, cause you to be accountable. You can keep running, but when you keep running, you're going to stay in the desert. But if you pursue what God has, pursue me, sometimes God's provision does not always look exactly as you hope. And this is a great lesson that we learn over the years. We just started saying, this wasn't what we prayed for. This looks like it's going backwards. But we can embrace it with gratitude. God, you're faithful. God, you're faithful. You're true. You're faithful. You are true. Loaves and fishes, 5,000. How did provision turn up that day? The greatest provision I never even recognized. The greatest work God was doing in our lives I never recognized. Because I try to prescribe it to God when he said, when are you going to start trusting me? Numbers 13, 28, it said, but the people who live there, these people in the promised land, they're powerful. The cities are fortified, very large. We even saw the descendants of the giants there. See, their issue was again, We expected a promised land that was free, not one that had to be fought for. We expect promises to fall upon us rather than breaking the the door open for the promise. There's something about possession, not just deliverance. And he was teaching his people, saying, come on, it might be there, but we can do it. The last one, last one we're going to... Number six, the dominion of gratitude possesses the promise. The dominion of gratitude possesses the promise. You've got to walk out the territory in the territory of gratitude. Gratitude is a territory. Dominion is a territory. So what is the dominion? It's almost like a sovereignty. It's a, a place. When you walk in gratitude, it's not just an attitude. It's a place you walk. It's a place you walk. You walk it through Monday, tomorrow. Middle of the week when certain things happen. You need to choose to put it on. You might get knocked for a minute and winded, but you've got to go, no, I'm going to choose gratitude. No, I'm going to choose gratitude. Lord, Lord. this is why it has a voice. And this is how I'm finishing. Gratitude has a voice. That's why we're so passionate about everything's a gift in our church, our DNA. That's why we're so passionate about wildfire passion. Because it's really saying that gratitude doesn't stay silent in me. And if somehow we come and we, you, I don't know, you worship, but uh, all your gratitude is hidden. You don't express it. That is a lie. It's a lie. It's, it's, it, it, you can't contain. You will see very clearly, even Jesus teaches it, that gratitude has a voice. It has a voice. It takes action. That's why we have praise and worship. That's why he designed for us to be a people that says, come into my courts with thanksgiving in your hearts and your mouths filled with praise. Will you enter and come before me? In all circumstances, give thanks. It's not an inward quiet word it's actually a word that says express it shout about it declare it declare his faithfulness and yet we come in and we struggle with a bit oh they're a bit passionate in that church there's a lot of froth in that church there's a lot of passion in that church I'm telling you there's a lot of gratitude in our church we know what we got saved from I know I was lost I know I was a wretch I know how far I was. I know that we had nothing going for us but just a handful of people that believed that God could make the difference. And we were in the desert for many years, but God said, you keep moving. And this one thing is going to be gratitude that will see you through. You got to walk out in the dominion of gratitude. Wherever you are right now, whatever desert you're in, whatever difficulty, whatever real situation you're struggling in right now, you need to choose to put on gratitude. You need to choose gratitude. Say you're faithful. Every time you voice gratitude, every time you lift your hand, every time you get out of your seat and cheer and champion what God is doing in his kingdom, there is something about gratitude. It comes through your bones. There's anointing. This isn't just a physical thing. This is a spiritual thing you were made for as God's people. And if we don't do it, it says that even the stones will cry out for it. 
God, help us with gratitude. I've known people through entitlement that are still in the desert after 30 years. I can give you a whole list of names. You say, where are they now? They're in that desert through entitlement. And I can show you a whole bunch of other names who aren't here because they pursued God and they've gone on because gratitude they chose. Gratitude caused them to move into the promise, into the job description to say, God, here I am. Send me. And so I'm praying right now, will you choose gratitude? As a church, I want us to have more gratitude. Everything's a gift in our church than ever, ever before, that he gave us everything, that everything we have, choose gratitude. It is a superpower, armor. It's like a, a fiery sort of arrow, busting sort of amazing thing that God has done. It's like, it's, I can't describe it enough. I'm so excited about it, the gratitude, because the reality of it, it saw us through. We hear, we have DLT meetings sometimes and talk about how we can increase in like our you know, quality and we just obviously want to have excellence and do more and more stuff. Sometimes the guys laugh at me because I'm just there saying, I think it all just sounds great. <laughs> oh yeah, but we need to like get this done, that, done and that. And I'm like, guys, from where I've come from, <laughs> when we talk about creatives, we used to have people dressed up in bin liners doing sister act. <laughs> And it was like, God, when are you going to deliver me? <laughs> now I see what our church does and I'm just there filled with gratitude because of where I've come from, what I remember. And if this is normal for you, you're going to need to work harder at gratitude. <sighs> Today, Holy Spirit, will you move? Holy Spirit, even right now, Lord, we respond as a people. I feel even now, God is calling us to repent for the way that we got entitled. There's some people even right now, you need to get on your knees and repent and say, sorry, Lord. Lord, I just got used to the miracle. I got used to the bread from heaven, Jesus. I got used to my salvation. I got used to the salvations that I hear about. I got used to the incredible worship we're part of. I got used to the family of God neglected it oh Jesus come in right now we're here as your people we come with thanksgiving in our hearts we say sorry and I pray even across the nations in our churches now Lord forgive us for entitlement forgive us for complaining when our plans didn't come out when we didn't hit the numbers we wanted to see when we put in effort and we saw a decrease forgive us for moaning and doubting Lord, we choose gratitude that we get chance. Help us not to prescribe what you want to do. Help us to vocalize gratitude to one another in honor, to humble ourselves, to esteem others, grateful for one another, grateful for marriages in this house, grateful for children being born in this house, grateful for our young people, grateful for our older generation, grateful for those that are going and coming, Grateful, oh God, for our volunteers. Father, we thank you that you put a mandate on our church. Father, your kingdom, it's a dominion. It's all birthed in the dominion of gratitude. So we dedicate ourselves again to gratitude. We will choose gratitude and it will see us through. It will see us through to the promise. And I come right now and I break every demonic spirit that is generational, that has come over your life, that has come and it's almost like brought a bondage of complaining and moaning and dissatisfaction. I break that in Jesus' name today because of the power of His name. I break it over your life. I say be ended. I pray even now there is going to be an allergic reaction when you start complaining. No longer callous but sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I ask for a sensitivity upon all of us, a conviction around when we open Open our mouth and start speaking death and complaining. Holy Spirit, seize hold of us and say, speak life. Choose life with your words. For out of your heart, your mouth speaks. We speak life, life, life. So in the name of Jesus, I say, Holy Spirit, would you fill us now? Fill us. Fill us as your people. Fill us in your churches. Fill us where the gratitude exists. Holy Spirit, you're present.
So we say, come more, come more, come more. Some of us have been waiting for something to get sorted or broken. And today, God is showing you that it's actually a choice of repentance from entitlement and a choice of gratitude. But you have to express it. You have to confess it. You have to clap it and cheer it. You have to demonstrate gratitude, God says. Through it, life comes. So in the name of Jesus, will you move right now in every location? Freedom, chains breaking, chains breaking. We're moving into the promise. The promise is coming. The promise, we're closer than ever. The promise is here. The promise is here. In Jesus' name, we all declare, amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you so much, Pastor G, for that amazing message. Guys, if you responded where you are, you can message us in the chat. You can speak to a leader in your location or you can email us at hello at freedomchurch.cc. Yeah, come on. So good. Guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Wherever you're joining us from, we hope you have an incredible week and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye, guys.